from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and coming up today, K-State's Sarah Lancaster goes over the herbicide choices for pre-plant weed control in advance of fall wheat planting, including a closer look at dealing with that notorious field bindweed. Then K-State's Kelsey Anderson Onafray announces that the university's 2021 Wheat Variety Disease and Insect Ratings Report is now available to you wheat producers. Also, on the latest FSA Coffee Talk, Nicole Wellborn reports that acceptance into the latest General Conservation Reserve Program sign-up has been announced. And later, K-State's Charlie Lee talks about the new proposal to list the lesser prairie chicken as a threatened and endangered species. All that ahead on this Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today, and welcoming in once more weed management specialist with K-State Research and Extension, Sarah Lancaster. As we head toward wheat planting time, the value of employing pre-emergence herbicides for weed control in emerging wheat. We'll take up that angle with Sarah right here today. And this is an option that some producers employ and some choose not to, Sarah. Thoughts on why that is? Well, wheat is considered to be, Eric, a highly competitive crop in terms of competing with weeds. And so, you know, sometimes there might be a thought that, well, that wheat's very competitive. It doesn't need a lot of help, which may or may not be the case. And I think another another reason why we might see folks sometimes, probably a bigger reason why we see folks sometimes skip on pre-emergence herbicides for their wheat is because they want to see what that wheat's going to do, right? There's a lot of cost and a lot of potential to lose that investment if something would go wrong with your wheat crop over the winter, if you have poor establishment or, or anything of that nature. So it should be a judgment call on the part of the producer? That would be your take? Well, Eric, you know, as a weed management specialist, I can tell you that the best time to kill a weed is before you ever see it. Pre-emergence herbicides are one of your best weed management tools. And so I think as much as anything, it probably depends on the history of that particular field and knowing what weed species are present. And then, you know, looking at wheat costs, plans for grazing, yield potential, et cetera. Well, that said, there are alternatives as far as pre-emergence herbicide product selection here. And you might walk us through the considerations. Absolutely, Eric. So, you know, most of the products that we're using in wheat are group two herbicides. And so these are our ALS inhibiting herbicides. Um, The downside of that, and this goes back to my earlier comment about needing to know the history of your field, is that we do have quite a few populations of weeds across the state that have developed resistance to ALS inhibiting herbicides. So that's something also to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind as we think about herbicides before planting is just the foundational weed science principle of starting clean and staying clean. You know, as you think about weeds that might be present in the field as you're preparing to plant your wheat crop, um, you're going to want to control those weeds, either by tillage or with herbicides or both, prior to planting. One of the prime considerations here, though, Sarah, is whether or not one wants to employ a herbicide product with residual activity or whether they can get by without that residual performance. And there are alternatives on both sides, right? That's right, Eric. So, you know, we all, as I've said before, we recommend residual herbicides in all of our cropping systems. In wheat and most other cropping systems, they're going to fall into a a handful of classes. So one would be the group two herbicides, so those ALS inhibiting herbicides. So things like maybe amber uh, would be an example there. Another option would be some of the group 15 herbicides. So something like Anthem Flex. Um, would be an example of a group 15 herbicide that's also combined with AIM um, or carfentrazone, which is a group 14 herbicide. Uh, But by and large, most of the herbicides in wheat that have residual activity are going to be group 2 products. Mm -hmm. And of course, as we go along here, folks can reference the Chemical Weed Control Guide from K-State for more specifics on all of those. But those that don't have any residual activity to speak of, can they still be valuable here? Absolutely, there's some value there, Eric. We want to, 
you know, talk about starting clean and staying clean for all of our crops. And so a burn down herbicide is often a very important component of that. You know, glyphosate is the poster child for burn down herbicides. But as we think about some of the weeds that we struggle with ahead of wheat, um, you know, there's value in 2,4-D, dicamba, or something like starane for controlling some of those weeds that might be present uh, before planting, thinking about things like maybe some of our pigweeds or, you know, in this e-update article that we just put out, we did talk about um, using 2,4-D in the, or dicamba in the fall to help control field bindweed, which I know is, is one that we perennially get questions on in wheat production. We, we do want to expand on that particular weed here in just a second. It merits extra attention, yes. as you're hinting. But when using some of the non-residuals, there is this consideration on planting interval, right? That's right. So, you know, we think about those group four herbicides that I just mentioned, 2,4-D, dicamba in particular. We think about those as controlling broadleaf weeds, but they're not completely ineffective on grasses. And so we can interfere with tillering and other processes in the wheat plant if we don't allow adequate time. And so depending on the product and the weather and the soil conditions, um, you know, it's important to check the label of your product because you could have up to a 45-day pre-plant interval. Uh, Most of them are going to be around, you know, 10 days to maybe two weeks or so. Read the label, of course. Read the label. (laughs) But back to what you hinted at, and it's a recurring theme. One wants to, over time, use an assortment of compounds to avoid that resistance issue. Absolutely, Eric. You know, using multiple herbicide modes of action is so important for managing herbicide resistance. So, you know, we can take advantage of the competitiveness of a wheat crop to, you know, try to make some progress in terms of drawing down the weed seed bank for some of our more troublesome weeds, um, as long as we stay on top of uh, weed control and do a good job of using multiple modes of action whenever possible for weed control. To that real headache (laughs) for (laughs) any number of wheat producers and other crop producers out there, but field bindweed, why is it so troublesome vis-a-vis some of the other common weeds? One of the biggest reasons field bindweed is so troublesome for farmers is because it's a perennial weed. So not only do we have to worry about managing the weed seed bank to manage it from year to year, we also have to draw down all of the stored energy that's in the the root system of that plant. And that is just a process that takes a lot of time. Field bindweed is also, you know, well adapted To life in the plains, it it can withstand the drier conditions because of that deep tap root. And a lot of times, you know, right now is not necessarily a real great time to try to control a plant that is drought stressed and things of that nature. So a lot of times what we see happen is that field bindweed is under the wheat crop and then we, we cut the wheat. We remove that competition, and now here we are in the middle of summer trying to control a very difficult-to-manage weed. It explodes. Mm -hmm. How important is it for wheat productivity? There's been a a long-run study at K-State's Agricultural Research Center at Hayes that's illustrated that. Yeah, this is an older study, and what they found in the study from Hayes is that over 12 years, the yield reduction in their wheat crop due to field bindweed interference ranged from 2% to 50, 50 50%. Mm, that speaks volumes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> then what are the recommended options for treating field bindweed ahead of seeding that wheat? So, you know, really some of the better products that we found for treating bindweed are the old products of 2,4-D, dicamba, and glyphosate. So in order to really get a good kill on this plant, we need things that are going to translocate to that root. And those three products move through the plant very well um, into the root. So 2,4-D, dicamba, and glyphosate are really the go-tos. Obviously in wheat, glyphosate's not an option. 2,4-D and dicamba um, can be an option before or in a wheat crop. So there's also some differences in the seasonality of which one works better when. Um, So as we think about, you know, this time of year going into wheat planting and, you know, if you see some in your wheat this fall, really we kind of like dicamba for fall applications. Um, It tends to provide a little bit better control in the fall. Is there merit in a tank mix here whatsoever? Yeah, you know, in in some situations a 2,4-D dicamba tank mix 
can be very effective. Another product that can be effective is a quinclorac-based product, something like Facet. So, you know, one of the things is trying to get it before a killing frost. So what, what perennial weeds tend to do is as they get closer to winter, they're starting to send more reserves to the roots to try to, to make it through the winter. So if we can try to um, kind of attack those plants at that point in time, uh, we can sometimes get a little bit better control. Control, though, is a multi-year prospect. That You've been stressing that, that you will not knock out your field bindweed issues in one fell swoop. That's right. You know, no weed management plan is a one-and-done proposition. But with something like field bindweed in particular, you know, you're, you're fighting a war and not a battle um, because you do have to deplete all of the energy um, that gets stored up in all of that extensive root system that that plant makes over the summer. Overall, though, pre-emergence herbicide management can be beneficial for wheat productivity. And if producers aren't employing that strategy, you'd like them to at least take a second look at it? That's right. This is one of those things that could potentially help bring a farmer into that kind of next level of yield. We would note that there is an article in the e-update newsletter dated Thursday, August the 5th on pre-emergence herbicides for wheat. Have a look at that. It's a good summary. And once more, take full advantage of the detailed information on pre-emergence herbicide programs for wheat cropping in the Chemical Weed Control Guide 2021 edition out of K-State, found at the K-State online bookstore or through your local extension office. Sarah, thanks, as always, for the input. Good to be here, Eric. Thanks. She's a weed management specialist, K-State Research and Extension, that is, Sarah Lancaster. We'll be back with more for you on this Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today, and continuing on now, letting you wheat producers know that quite important information is now at hand for you as you Contemplate your variety selections for this fall planting season. K-State's annual wheat disease and insect ratings report is now out and available. And among those contributing to it, wheat disease specialist Kelsey Anderson Onafray of K-State Research and Extension. She's along with us now. And you put a lot of work, of course, Kelsey, you and your colleagues into this publication. Remind us just exactly what it's about and basically what's in it. Oh, yeah, you bet. So thanks for having me here today. So this guide has been going on, oh, I think for at least 30 years, but probably more than that. And really what it is, is is a, a summary of data, multi-year data about disease and insect reactions of the most popular varieties and some historical varieties that are grown here in Kansas, and also a large amount of agronomic data that's contributed by um, Romulo Lolato. So there's actually a lot of information packed into this publication. And we have some text up front, some information about what diseases are important where. Local producers are probably very, very familiar with that, but it's always good to have a little summary. We go through a bit of a summary in the beginning about, you know, just above average varieties for certain diseases that are important in certain parts of the state or, you know, varieties that need to be, you know, managed a little more intensively, right, might need a fungicide, might need to be watched for some of those viral diseases. And then it goes through some variety profiles. So we kind of uh, do some spotlights of different varieties that are either new or up and coming in the state, we make some comments about them. So for this year, for example, We added four, KS Hatchet, which is a Kansas Weed Alliance variety. We also added SY Wolverine this year and two other varieties, I believe WB4699 and also Rockstar. And so we've added those to the profile. So go in and check out those comments. And then also we've added more in the back of the document. So kind of a, if you walk through the document, you'll see those profiles. Then you'll see a table basically that lists all of the disease reactions and insect reactions where one is very resistant, nine is very susceptible. And then you'll also find 
agronomic ratings. So we go through maturity, height ratings, drought tolerance, and straw strength. Again, one is a better value in some cases, and, and nine is, is a worse value or maturity early versus late, that kind of thing. There's, there's a good table there to talk you through how to interpret it. I want to just point out the last page, which goes through some of the herbicide resistance technologies that are available in wheat. So we have a little write-up about clear field and also coaxium technologies. And we also go through the disease resistance there. So be sure to kind of page to that last page and check that out if that's a tool that's going to work for your farm. This is as comprehensive as one could possibly want here, Kelsey. And you do include, of course, evaluations for the entire list of prominent wheat diseases in Kansas, right? Yep, yep, we do. And so a lot of that, we always make sure that that's based on multiple observations, many of them from our own inoculated nurseries that represent very high disease pressure. So we really put these varieties to the test and get a lot of eyes on them before we do include them. So, you know, there might be varieties that are very, very new that we just can't include because we just don't have the data. And we, we try to be pretty conservative about that here. And once more, the data is based in large part on the updated information from this 2021 wheat production season. As you have worked through all of this, Kelsey, were there, to put it this way, any specific trends in diseases that would stand out from prior years? Oh, yeah. Well, this was a year where we certainly had high striped breast pressure in parts of the state. So we did get a lot of striped breast notes, both from inoculated nurseries and just from very high natural pressure locations. Also, there were spots where there was high fusarium head blight this year and also wheat streak mosaic. So those were kind of the big three that really stood out this year as, as very problematic in, in parts of the state. And you mentioned the, the head blight. and that, This was a banner year and, and an unprecedented year in some parts of Kansas for that disease because of the wet conditions and so forth. So if producers were caught off guard by head blight this year, this would be a great opportunity to prepare for the potential of next year presenting the same problem through this information you provided. Yeah, absolutely. So we did see it in parts of the West, Western parts of Kansas, where we just don't see that disease often because there was that moisture, but then we know that the, the pathogen is out there, right? We know the inoculum is there. So if there is another wet year, there's the potential for a disease. So really keeping an eye on those fusarium head blight ratings as we're making that variety decision coming up here very soon, or making sure that we have that potential need for a fungicide application in the back of our minds as we move into that flowering window next season. And you mentioned fungicides. For so many growers, fungicide use has become a commonplace management step, but it is a combination of fungicide applications and varietal selection. You like producers to think comprehensively when they map out their disease prevention strategy. Yes, absolutely. And that's the best way, you know, kind of marrying those two, some intermediate disease resistance plus a fungicide really is the, the best way to control fusarium head blight. So neither of those two work very well, you know, alone. So when you put them together, especially if you have high infection, that's really where you're going to see the most control in those high pressure years. So yeah, it's always good to think about resistance. That's definitely our tool that we have right there in the bag that we don't have to worry about later on, but that timely fungicide decision can be married with a good variety. We're talking about the 2021 data, but one needs to think to a certain extent in historical parameters, don't they? And and what uh, a certain variety has done over time in its disease resistance? Yeah, that's right. So we definitely include multiple years of data here. So, you know, just one year, one location wouldn't be enough to really say how a variety is going to perform. So here we include multiple years and Again, for some of these diseases like striped breast, those reactions change, right? Because the populations do change over time. And we try to update that information as much as possible in this document. So that's how any given variety could potentially go from a four for striped breast to a seven for striped breast over time. And that's just reflected on that more recent multi-year data. So it's always good to, you know, even if it's a variety we're pretty familiar with, go back and, and actually check the numbers before planting just to make sure none of that has changed. 
Well, really, it should be thought of as a must resource for our wheat producers in Kansas as they go about their varietal choices and uh, factoring in disease management in those choices. And where they can find this brand new report, Kelsey, it's out there online, if nothing else, right? Yep. So it's out there, available in the bookstore. If you had the link saved from last year, it should just update there. And then it should be in the latest um, e-update issue. So please take a look there as well. That bookstore address, ksre.ksu.edu slash bookstore. And as Kelsey says, it's uh, been covered in the latest Agronomy e-update newsletter posted at agronomy.ksu.edu this past Friday. Check that out and make full use of all of the information that Kelsey and team have collected on wheat disease resistance variety by variety in the K-State trials this year. Thanks, Kelsey, for going over this with us right here. Thanks for having me. She's Kelsey Anderson Onofre, the wheat disease specialist with K-State Research and Extension and a co-author of the new publication, 2021 Wheat Variety Disease and Insect Ratings. On a related note, want to remind you once again of something we brought to your attention last week here on the broadcast that K-State Research and Extension and Kansas Wheat have announced the launching of what's called Wheat Rx, a new program designed to convey to you Kansas wheat producers the very latest research recommendations for producing high-yielding and high-quality wheat. This will be a series of extension publications and other educational materials. Those will contain the most recent data based on novel research on intensive wheat management conducted by K-State and supported through the Kansas Wheat Commission's Wheat Assessment. Again, K-State Wheat Production Specialist Ramalo Lulato is coordinating this program. He's been, as you know, the lead researcher on several projects the past few years, focusing on those intensive management practices for wheat. Ramalo has also collected data from hundreds of commercial wheat fields directly from farmers across Kansas to evaluate the management practices common to those top-tier wheat producers. And the first in the series of those Wheat Rx publications is now out there. Wheat Variety Selection will be discussing some of the highlights of that with Romulo a couple of days from now. But you can go right to that now at kswheat.com slash wheatrx. And there will be more publications in this series released by K-State on an ongoing basis. Check all of it out at kswheat.com slash wheat rx a great informational resource unfolding here you're tuned in to agriculture today and following this break we'll be back with the latest edition of fsa coffee talk and much more for you keep it right here on the k-state radio network Agriculture Today returns now, and we're around to time once again for another update from the Farm Service Agency State Headquarters for Kansas. Lots perking with the Conservation Reserve Program. We'll cover all of that right here with Nicole Wellborn. Nicole is a Conservation Program Specialist with the Kansas FSA. Let's begin with this. Business is now complete, Nicole, in regard to the 2021 signups for the general CRP and grassland CRP. Those deadlines have now passed and some action is evident here. Tell us what's going on. Absolutely. So the ranking results for general signup 56 were released and nationwide there were approximately 1.9 million acres accepted. So Kansas producers with pending uh, general CRP offers can expect to hear from their administrative county office very soon with further details and instructions for the next steps with their offer, whether it was accepted or rejected. And then the grassland CRP sign-up just ended on Friday. So those ranking results with further instruction will be coming a little later. All right. More to come on that. But as far as that general sign-up, because it's fresh news, still sorting through the, the number of producers that were approved and the level of acreage, those details will be forthcoming. But those local offices will be fully briefed on all of that. Yeah, 
County offices will begin contacting producers and we'll get the ball rolling, moving forward with offers that were accepted and what to do with acres that were not accepted. But with the conclusion of those signups, there is the ongoing CRP opportunity, Nicole, that you wanted to remind producers about. Absolutely. So with the conclusion of both those signups, the Grassland and General Signup FSA, just wants to remind everybody that eligible acres can still be offered into continuous CRP at any time. That sign-up is on a continuous basis. Um, those practices are generally geared towards what FSA calls environmentally sensitive acreages. So, for example, acreages bordering perennial streams where CRP can be used to address erosion and chemical runoff along field edges or in strips and patches within crop fields where CRP can be used to establish wildlife habitat buffers. Um, also, areas of wind erosion, um, CRP can be used to establish windbreaks and living snow fences. Things of that nature, wetlands and playa restoration practices are available through continuous sign-up. And grass waterways, contour grass strip practices, and then continuous sign-up is also where uh, state acres for wildlife enhancement or our space practices are available. Mm -hmm. uh, those are practices that are developed locally in cooperation with Kansas' wildlife partners, and they target specific wildlife needs of Kansas. So like lesser prairie chicken, Kansas has some of the biggest habitat region for lesser prairie chicken, and we use SAFE to address those uh, mm -hmm. out in western Kansas. And then also FSA partners with Kansas Department of Ag, uh, to develop a conservation reserve enhancement program, or CREP is what we call it. We've uh, recently amended it and expanded it, um, the Upper Arkansas CREP project. Uh, we expect to roll that out in early October, October 1st, hopefully. And that initiative addresses water conservation along the Upper Arkansas River in southwest Kansas. So more details will be coming about that uh, before its rollout in October. So stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm. Quite a bit going on, and you've listed several features of the continuous CRP. So you would simply ask producers interested in any of these possibilities to have that conversation with their local FSA folk. Absolutely. Yep. And those are just a few of the many available practices and initiatives under continuous. So we encourage anybody interested in CRP not to give up since general and grassland is over, but uh, visit your local FSA office or inquire um, and see what may be available to you if you're interested in CRP. I just want to encourage you to do what you can. You don't have to wait. Contact your local FSA office, and they can work through the details of your options with you. Very well. One more thing we do want to mention, Nicole, and further details coming here, but this is rather late-breaking as well. Yesterday afternoon, the USDA announced that certain areas of Kansas will be eligible for emergency haying and grazing of Conservation Reserve Program acres where drought has been pressing. Producers need to be alert to that. Yes. Any county in Kansas that reaches a D2 status during the fiscal year becomes eligible for emergency hang and grazing. In the announcement, there are still counties uh, that are eligible um, based on the listing provided, and we would just encourage anyone um, looking to possibly complete some emergency activity on their CRP to contact your local FSA office to fill out the paperwork, make sure their um, county is still supporting it, still warranted um, based on their county committee's determination. So we would just encourage you to contact them. So be aware of that, producers, likewise. And Nicole, thanks for bringing us up to speed on the latest goings-on with the Conservation Reserve Program here in Kansas. We will talk again soon. Thank you, Eric. She's Nicole Wellborn, Conservation Program Specialist with the State Farm Service Agency headquarters here in Manhattan. And coming your way now... This week's edition of Milk Lines with K-State Dairy Specialist, Mike Brook. Mike. Today I want to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning the last few harvest of alfalfa that we have yet this growing season. Most of you have probably taken either your third or fourth cutting of alfalfa. And you need to really start watching the fields as, in terms of regrowth. Been a lot of reports of potato leaf hoppers and other issues with insects as we start to see some of these later cuttings start to regrow. If you cut your alfalfa 
10 days ago and you still aren't seeing quite as many green leaves as you think you should be, probably need to get down on your hands and knees and see for sure what's going on. Just driving by on the highway probably isn't going to really help you understand that. Or if you work with a crop consultant, make sure that your crop consultant is still visiting your fields very often and actually checking to see if we have some insect development starting. One of the issues that we do have with the leaf hoppers is they do tend to come in fairly quickly and then they do actually multiply fairly quick. So if you start to see some brown leaves out there, more than likely that this time of year, that could be one of your main issues there. In some cases, we may need to apply some insecticide yet. It may be before you get to your next cutting that you'd have significant loss if you did not use some insecticide to try to control the insects that might be out there. The other thing you need to keep in mind is that we could see army worms again in the fall. And this is another thing that can really reduce your alfalfa yields on these later cuttings. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers to continue their diligence in watching out for insects in their alfalfa fields in the late fall season. Thanks, Mike. And this is Agriculture Today. Agriculture Today is back now, and for another glance at wildlife management now, research and extension wildlife specialist Charlie Lee. Charlie, it's back to a topic we have talked of at length in the past, the lesser prairie chicken, common in the Central Plains, and it is now proposed for being listed as a species in need of federal protection once more. Yes, this is a unique species of prairie grouse. Uh, Kansas is somewhat fortunate in that we have a majority of the population of all of the lesser prairie chicken that are left in the world. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is proposing to list two distinct population segments of the lesser prairie chicken under the Endangered Species Act. Now, the southern distinct population segment is proposed to be listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act, and the northern population is to be listed as threatened with a 4D rule that tailors some specific protections for the species. The proposed 4D rule provides for exceptions for continuing routine agricultural activities and for the application of prescribed fire for grassland communities. Those routine agricultural exemptions provide that the take of the lesser prairie chicken will not be prohibited, provided that take is incidental to activities that are conducted during the continuation of routine agricultural practices on cultivated lands that are in row crop, seed drilled, untilled crop, hay, or forage production. I found it somewhat interesting that there's not anything listed there that pertains to grazing management. The lesser prairie chicken population is based on grasslands, and the, by far the vast majority of grasslands in this country are still grazed by livestock. We have good populations in Kansas because of CRP, which is only grazed under exemption rules, and because of some of the species that were grass species that were planted in the CRP, Kansas has weathered some of the other problems with lesser prairie chicken populations that other states have not been able to overcome. And that prompts the question, why has this action been proposed? Because we have talked in the past about, well, state-initiated conservation programs to support lesser prairie chicken. Well, there's no one particular reason why it's being brought back up again, other than that they were in 2016, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was petitioned to list them because of best available science. They took some time to look at all of the information. They're still waiting to collect public comment periods, which that comment period will end at the end of this month. So people that have new information from the public or the scientific community need to get that information to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service by the deadline so that they can consider that 
before they make a decision whether to list them as it is proposed. The primary reasons that they are intending to list is a result of habitat loss and fragmentation caused by a variety of sources. We suspect that there's no more than 80 to 90 percent of the historic grasslands are still available, that we've lost 80 to 90 percent of the historic grasslands. And when you have a bird that depends on grasslands and you lose that large of a percentage, there's certainly going to be an impact on the population. And have we seen that impact? Has it translated into falling numbers yet? It's translated into dramatically falling numbers. If we look at some of the population information from the 70s, there may may have been as many as 150,000 males range-wide of lesser chickens. That population stayed there until in the 90s. Now it's down to about 30,000. So we can see that the population has certainly declined. Take a five or 10 year drought and it's probably going to be enough to push some of those birds uh, into extinction in the locations where habitat is marginal. And that would be primarily in that southern distinct population segment. We know that the bird depends upon livestock grazing and the residual vegetation and the more heavily altered Areas that have been grazed heavily over the years are going to be the least valuable properties for lesser prairie chicken conservation. They've got to contain the necessary biological components that are necessary to allow the the prairie chicken to nest successfully, to raise young successfully, and to overwinter. If this proposal goes through then and uh, the lesser prairie chicken is affirmed as a threatened and endangered species, the repercussions for agriculture clear-cut? No, I would say they're not clear-cut. We know that this has been subject to uh, lawsuits in the past. Mm -hmm. Uh, I suspect there could be opportunity for attorneys to get involved again and perhaps um, it can be overturned. But the main thing to keep in mind is that we can't continue the same direction we're going and expect different results. Something has to change. When we provide more incentives, I think we can get some improvement in grazing land management without incentives, just the threat of regulation. It's probably not going to work out well. Well, it's been a lightning rod topic, to be perfectly frank about it, in the past, and it is back again, noting, as Charlie said earlier, that the comment period for this proposed rule to list the lesser prairie chicken under the Endangered Species Act is receiving comments until the end of this month, August the 31st. Go to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service website for more information. Charlie, thanks for bringing us up to date on that today. Former wildlife specialist, K-State Research and Extension, Charlie Lee with us. As we go, and just as a periodic reminder, each and every one of our daily broadcasts is archived online in podcast form for going back and re-listening to a given segment. Or if you happen to miss our over-the-air broadcast one day or the other, you can go to agtoday.net. Each day's broadcast can be found there in reverse chronological order for downloading and listening. Also, if you are so inclined, you can subscribe to an automatic free download of that day's broadcast directly to your mobile device. The steps for lining that up also at agtoday.net. We hope you'll take advantage of those listening alternatives. In the meantime, we'll be right back here tomorrow and hope you will be likewise. Until then, Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.